Tonight, it's come to our attention that uh, comments are, can be, you know, the length, especially if there are lengthier comments that are made for people who are online, they obviously are not able to hear those comments. It's kind of, uh, it's more of a deterrent, a detriment than it is a help for these classes. So, um, Dale, can you raise your hand so people know who you are? Yeah, Dale, Dale right here. Uh, Dale is going to be our mic guy tonight. Uh, and if you have a comment that you know is going to be longer than just two or three words, you know, if it's two or three words, you can yell it out. I can repeat it, it's not a big deal. But if you've got a prolonged comment, and some of y'all are more apt to make a prolonged comment, you know who you are, um, wait for the mic to get there so that the folks that are at home are going to be able to hear the entirety of the comment. And if you don't wait, I might cut you off and just be like, hey, whoop, wait, wait, Kelly, come on, stop, you know, and just cut you off there and make you wait a second for the mic to catch up. Uh, so we're gonna try to do that. We're not going back to having the, the phone with the mic, um, you know, because our whole setup is different now. It's not what we were doing before, so we can't zoom straight in the way that we did before. But hopefully for you folks at home, um, or maybe on the road or whatever the case is, hopefully this will help uh, you to feel more engaged. All right, everybody with me there? Yes. We good? All right, excellent. Uh, so as we are getting into Hebrews chapter five, let's make sure that we are remembering um, everything that we've talked about so far. He starts it off by saying that at one point in time, God spoke to whom? Our fathers through, through the prophets and various means. Today, he speaks to us through whom? Through the Son. It should be. I mean, I, is, are they not hearing it online? It shouldn't be. So, because I know that the sound is coming through fine, because I watched the bar earlier, um, you know, as it showed it on the computer. Um, so, I, I don't know what the deal is. It's, it's not a fixable issue, is what I'm saying. So, it's not a fixable issue tonight. Um, you know, maybe we, I can listen to it sometime. But, uh, yes? Yes. If it's on. It's on. Yeah. Is it green? Yeah. I'm not getting anything. Hmm. You have song leader and preacher on? I have, uh, Corey, I have the song leader mic. Okay. All right. Yeah. Both. Just leave both of those open the entire time, and we won't. We won't have to worry about switching. All right. So we're good now. I think that was the issue. My mic was muted, so I think I think we're good now. All right. Excellent. Um, so the uh, first chapter, Jesus, or well, this entire thing really is all about comparing what. All right, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And the New Covenant, someone said it just a second ago, everything is really about Jesus, right? And Jesus with what? Over here in chapter 1. All right, the angels. Why? Okay. Remember, we, we start with status, servant to son, and then what they do, what did they do? Well, the servants, but they, of what? Okay, the law came through them, right? So they were the law givers. So they were ministers who gave the old law, whereas Jesus is the son who provides the new law, right? Therefore, Jesus is greater than the angels. Uh, we go into chapter 2. And what do we talk about? 
All right, Moses. All right, first of all, status. Okay, he is, he is the servant of servants, right? Maybe we could even use the word steward. Um, you know, he was faithful in all God's house. Numbers uh, chapter 12, right? He was faithful in all of God's house, even at his best. How does he compare to Jesus? All right, he's the owner of the house, right? This is the son. This is the one. It is his house. Um, you know, he is, he's the one who builds the house. He, he creates it. So, you know, uh, and then, so that is the status. Um, and then from there, what did they do? What did Moses do? It can't be the law. Remember, we already talked about the law with the angels. So what's, what else is Moses known for besides the giving of the law? Okay, leading the people. All right, leading the people out of their um, bondage. Thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. Out of their bondage into rest, right? I mean, that's what they're known for. That's what Moses does. He leads them into rest. But yet, even then, that generation that Moses led out, they did not see God's rest. What about Jesus? What does he offer? All right, an even greater rest than what it was that was provided through Moses. A rest uh, that goes back, really, all the way to the beginning. And this rest is the rest that we still have waiting for us, right? In chapters 3 and 4, where it discusses that rest. There still remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Um, so that is what is offered there through Moses. Um, and then we get into our stuff tonight. We're really starting tonight. We're going to pick up um, from here on out is the main bulk of what his argument is. This, this is... You know, this is what really has the teeth uh, as far as his argumentation goes. Yeah, this is all about kind of the law of Moses and, and the people. But now we're going to get to the heart of what was it meant to accomplish. And that's going to be a discussion about what Jesus compared to. All right, the high priest, right? And so, you know, we can say just in general priests, but in essence, it's really going to be what priesthood? Over here. No? All right, Aaron, right? And so we're going to make a comparison between the Aaronic priesthood and then another, as of yet, unknown, even though Kelly said it a couple of times, priesthood over on the other side, right? Uh, so, what's that? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so for those of you at home, Kelly tried to answer this as Melchizedek a couple of times, just, just to make sure that uh, they, they, knew, they knew that was the case. All right, starting in then, chapter 5, Hebrews uh, chapter 5, I'm actually going to back up a couple verses into chapter 4, starting verse 14. Since then, since we have a high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then have com with confidence draw near to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. 
So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but he was appointed by him who said, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he also said in another place somewhere, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. About this, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who uh, have the powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, Instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. And this will do, if God permits, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they're crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that is drunk, the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. All right, that's as far as... Um, we probably would even dare to hope to make tonight. We'll see if we get that far. Remember earlier when I said, like, over the last few weeks, let's not bog ourselves down because we've got some really good discussion coming? We're getting into that really good discussion that's coming, uh, and, and it's going to flow. We've given ourselves plenty of time to cover the next few sections here, and so we start. Um, verses 14 through 16 of chapter 4, we're not going to delve into those. Um, they really probably belong with the last section because they're doing what he did at the end of chapter 2 as well, uh, where he's introducing concepts about the high priest that he's going to get into later. Uh, and, and so these ideas are just being introduced, they're, they're kind of just being dropped onto the table, and then he kind of looks away like, oh, they'll just, just pretend they're not there for a second, but I'm going to go back and pick them up, and they're going to be really important in a little bit. Uh, and so with that, he, he talks about the high priest uh, who sympathizes with weaknesses. Verse 16, let us draw uh, with confidence, draw near to the throne of God. Uh, all of these ideas are just, they're just kind of going to sit there, and then we move forward. So now let's talk about priesthood. This is what we get into in the chapter 5 as we start talking about priesthood. Um, where do priests come from? This, it's right, it's in the text. I'm, I'm not, this, this isn't a, boy, really give this some thought. Oh, All right, they come from the people, right? Uh, that's the very first thing right here. A priest comes from among the people. And why is that important, that a priest will come from among the people? Or is it? Okay. Yeah, he's one of the group, right? He's a part of the group. Uh, he knows what's happening. He has experienced it. Um, you know, if we were to, well... Let's just put it in our own type of uh, language today. Um, you know, if we were going to select a president 
for our nation, what's one of the requirements of that? He has to be a what? He has to be a citizen, right? You can't go off to Australia, find a guy that you're like, well, I think this guy would make a good president, and bring him over here and set him up. It doesn't work. He has to be a part of this system. He has to be a citizen. He has to know it. He has to understand it. He has to have lived it. And it's, a, it's the same thing, the priesthood, the one who stands between the rest of the people and God, he has to be someone who understands the rest of the people. Therefore, what had to happen? For us to have Jesus as our high priest. All right. He had to come and be one of us, right? I mean, there's, there's no way to get around that. And that's really the point. Every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God. And what does he do? Okay. Yeah, he offers gifts and he offers sacrifices. Um, he does this on behalf of men. He, does, he offers gifts and sacrifices for sins. And because he is from among the people, he can deal gently with those who are ignorant or wayward because he has his own weaknesses. So he has to first offer up, or what he does, he offers up gifts and sacrifices. And what's the first offering that he has to give? All right, he has to offer for himself because he has his own weaknesses. Everybody see that? All right, are we good so far? You know, and this, this isn't the, uh, well, we're going to get into a deep discussion about this so far. I, I think I'm just making sure we're all on the same page uh, because as you move forward, you see in, in verse 5, uh, just as in verse 4, you know, nobody is, just takes the honor upon themselves. Uh, how did Aaron become the high priest? All right, God appointed him. He didn't say, you know, it's not like God came down and said, all right, Moses, you're our leader, but we still need a high priest. And Aaron's like, dude, right here, I am all over that, right? No. You know, God said, all right, take out Aaron, take out his, his sons. And they went through a lengthy process in order to purify them in a specific way, gave them certain laws that they had to do. All kinds of stuff take place there in Leviticus because it was chosen by God. So also, uh, in verse 5, Christ did not exalt himself to be a high priest. How did he become one? Say that again, Mike. All right, he was appointed. In the same way as Aaron's appointed, Jesus is appointed. And so you see these passages here. Uh, the first one, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Um, I think that's Psalm 2, unless I'm getting them mixed up there. Um, I'm sure you guys have references. You'll be able to correct me there. All right, I see a nod. So, all right, so Psalm 2. Remember, Psalm 2, it, it's one of the coronation psalms, uh, and it's the psalm, at least I think the, the great coronation psalm, uh, because it's there in chapters 1 and 2, they go together, but we're not in the psalms class, that'll come later. Um, but you see this as, as the coronation where God appoints his leader, and then as everybody else tries to overthrow him, God sits in the heavens and laughs at him and says, yeah, you, you have no power. This is the one I have chosen. Now, it is interesting that that's referring to a king, whereas here he's saying it's referring to a priest. <laughs> but this also goes back to some of that Midrashic concept that we talked about. And then in verse 6, and there's another place, by the way, where he also, do you think that um, this guy just had a slip like, he's like, oh, man, I know it's somewhere. I just can't remember where it is. No, I, all right. 
The author here, again, we don't know exactly who it is, but the guy knows his Bible, all right? This is a rhetorical device that's being used here. Uh, and I say rhetorical because, remember, I think this is a sermon that's being done. And he's like, and I mean, there's this other place. Oh yeah, it just happens to be one of the greatest psalms of the entire thing. A psalm, by the way, that is, you know, it's one that starts out, the Lord said to my Lord, said to my right hand, until I make an enemy, of, uh, your enemies a footstool for your feet. It's already been quoted back in chapter one. Uh, he's like, oh yeah, by the way, somewhere, maybe it's just the single greatest messianic psalm in the Psalter. Uh, yeah, that one says you are a priest forever according to the order of whom? All right, now, Kezedek. All right, so, we have here then the Aaronic priesthood and the Melchizedekian priesthood. I probably made that word up, but that's okay. Uh, so, these are the two that are going to be under discussion. And then we get into this, just, it's almost weird, uh, because he then goes straight into saying, hey, he is our high priest. And remember, what did we learn about high priest or yeah, priesthood just a moment ago? A priesthood, a priest does what? He offers gifts and sacrifices. He does so on behalf of the people, and he offers what first? He offers his own sacrifices for himself because of what? Well, his weakness, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, that's in verse 2. Uh, well, verse 2 has the weakness, but because of this, he's obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sin, just as he does for the other people. Um, so, here in verse 7, in the same way, in the days of Jesus, what does it say that Jesus did? Okay, yes, but what does it say? What are the words, someone tell me the exact words. In this, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication. What's the language there? Just as the priest offered up sacrifices? Don't miss this, the Hebrews author is using that same language. Jesus has also offered up something, right? What does he offer up? On whose behalf? On his own behalf, right? The same way that the priesthood before offered up sacrifices first on his own behalf, now the Hebrews author is making the point that Jesus is offering something up on his own behalf. But what's the difference? Okay, he doesn't need to offer up what? All right, he doesn't offer up sacrifices for himself. But Josie, what does he offer up? Well, he offers up prayers, right? Prayers and supplications about himself. Why that difference? What's the significance here? Kathy? Jesus didn't have a weakness. He had to make sacrifices for Okay, what well, Kathy said, Jesus did not have weaknesses that he had to make sacrifices for. Um, I would agree he did not have to make sacrifices for himself. But does that mean he has no weakness? He has no sin. But does that mean he has no weakness? Okay, Dale, can you go back there and we'll let, and let Mike see if he could repeat that word for word? I want to make sure that folks at home hear this.
All right. He took on flesh, which means that he could die. And if he could die, then theoretically, he could what? Well, yeah, theoretically, yes. In the realm, in, in the realm of potentiality out there, could Jesus have sinned? Absolutely, that's what it means when it says he was tempted. You cannot be tempted if there is no ability to actually sin. It's not a temptation if, you know, the action's an impossibility. Um, so absolutely. But if he could die, there's a chance that he could stay in that grave, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of what's here. He, he offered prayers and supplications to the one who's able to do what? All right, the one who's able to save him from death. And then it says that he was heard because of his reverence. Wait, how could he have been heard? He died, didn't he? What does it mean he was heard? But by, by the way, when it says he was heard, that doesn't mean, you know, that, that's the locution. The illocution, though, what was meant by this, is not that God said, oh, I heard that, okay, moving on. When it means, what it means is that God heard and answered the prayer the way that he wanted it answered. That, that's what that phrase, and he was heard because of his reverence. In other words, God answered his prayer but how's that possible? Because he still died. What do y'all think? Say that again. All right, he died. He didn't stay dead, right? Remember when we talked about Psalm 16? Uh, and how the Jews at one point in time, they would have looked at that and they would have thought that when it says you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay, that that meant you won't allow your Holy One to die. And then you have Peter and Paul coming along saying, guys, hold on, wait, what if we've had it wrong all this time? And it's not that he won't die, it's that he'll die, but he won't stay dead. And he won't decay, and he'll come out of it. What if that's the same argument that the Hebrews author is making right here, that he, 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 he made prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who's able to save him from his own weakness, the ability to die, the one who's able to save him from death, and he was heard. He, was he saved from death? Yes. He was brought out of death. He was resurrected at that point. Um, and so he does this for himself, and, and you get that, verses 8 and 9, although he was a son, it says that he what? He learned obedience through what he suffered. Now, can we just pause for just a second here? Um, how many of you guys have, have like paused on this before and scratched your head. Anybody? All right, why? What's the issue here? What do we have a problem with in this verse? We, we have a picture of Jesus always being obedient. Okay. All right. Very good. So, first of all, I'm just going to make a break here. You have his obedience, and what does it say about his obedience? That he learned. He learned obedience. Um, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put, put what Dale said uh, just a second ago. I'm going to put it on the back burner for just a second. Let's talk about this one. Have you ever considered that God in the flesh, God, right? Are we, are we good, by the way, that Jesus is God in the flesh? fullness of deity in bodily form. All right, so God did what? Learned. Learned something. How many of you kind of raise your eyebrows at that idea? That God learned something. In other words, there is something that's outside the scope of God's knowing. We talk about God as omnipotent, omniscient, 
omnipresent, omni this, omni that, omni whatever, right? And part of that omniscience is all knowing. How can an all knowing one need to learn? Kelly, you want Dale to come up? All right, Dale's on his way. He was already meandering towards you, so. I saw his hand. Yeah. He, he learned by doing. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between theoretically knowing mm -hmm. what it means to be obedient and having to humble yourself and do it when you don't want to. And Jesus didn't want to. He told God in the garden, please, I don't want to do this. But he learned by doing it. And now he can say to God, man, sometimes it's really hard to, to obey. And I understand why, why Kelly didn't. And he's asking us to forgive him, so we probably should. Yeah, I, I think you just expounded exactly on what this is. I would ask if everyone heard him, but he was Mike, so I, I hope you heard him okay. Um, you know, this, this idea of what it means to learn obedience, and, and I'm, we're going to repeat that idea in just a second, but I just want to get this through. First of all, there is something outside the scope of God's knowing. And that's a tough, at least for me, maybe y'all are like, well, duh, of course, no big deal. We hashed this out, you know, 20 years ago, and we say it to ourselves every morning since. I mean, you know, may, maybe so. For me, this is a tough one. When you think of God as who he is, that there is something outside the scope of his knowing. And, and as Kelly's pointing out, it's not some kind of book knowledge that's under discussion. This is what comes under experiential knowledge, experiential understanding. As Kelly said, doing it. There's a difference between something in theory and something in action. And what Jesus does is through his obedience, through his suffering, right? Isn't that what it says? He learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Through his suffering, he learns what it means to go through exactly what Kelly just said just a second ago. I don't want to rehash it because he did a really good job of explaining this. But he learned obedience. And he learned how, as Kelly said, how difficult obedience is. He learned what it means to be one of us who's dealing with the temptation that God in the heavens does not deal with because he's not one of us. And that's the whole reason that Jesus became one of us, is so that he could learn obedience by suffering. And once he went through this, he then stands ready. He's already offered something on his own behalf, right? What did he offer? All right, he offered prayers and supplications for himself because of his weakness, his weakness being that he was a, uh, the fullness of deity, but in bodily form that could and did die. But then he was brought out of that. He learned obedience. He has now become the perfected high priest who has taken care of it. Whatever weakness for himself has been taken care of first, now he stands ready to minister and to... Um, you know, verse 9, being made perfect, he becomes the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And he's been designated by God a priest after the order of Melchizedek. All right. You guys ready to start talking about this Melchizedek guy? Oh, we can't yet. We have to wait because <laughs> the Hebrews author doesn't start talking about Melchizedek yet. Yeah. The thing that's making me scratch my head is why he stops talking about his point for like a chapter and a half to rip on the readers for being babies and then talk about people who have fallen away and how hard it is to get them back. And then he gets back to his point. And I, I don't understand why this uh, parenthesis is here. 
That is an excellent question. I'm debating on whether to wait until we get to the point where you go, where you suddenly say, oh, is that what he's doing? Um, and then we can bring it out then. Or I could just kind of give you a heads up now, and then you can kind of see it. Which, which one? Would you rather get the heads up now, or do you want to just kind of wait and see it later? Heads up now. Well, I'm glad you guys are so excited. Everyone, I, was, I, I thought, man, you guys would be like up and debating and yelling at each other and all kinds, but no, no, you're just like, yeah, eh, whatever. Um, a lot of it um, comes from this phrase uh, where he says it. Let me just back up into uh, Psalm 110 and. Um, in verse Psalm 110 for the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind you are a priest forever according to the order after the order of Melchizedek I think that during this time this is a new idea this idea of Melchizedek and he's wanting to bring it out with absolute force and he wants to bring it out with the force of the phrase, the Lord has sworn. But before he does that, he's going to lead them into what it means for God to swear something. And that's the parentheses. That's the payoff of the parentheses. So pay attention as we go through the parentheses and follow his line of reasoning until you get there. And then you'll be like, oh, wait, is that what he was doing? Okay, I kind of see it. I mean, keep in mind, he does say in chapter 6, and what is it, verse 14? Um, hold on. Oh, no. I thought we had plenty of time. We get, we get done. Ah. Oh. All right, yeah. Yeah, it's on, it's a... Uh, it's Sunday nights that we go to like 10. Yeah, all right. I thought I had 10 more minutes. We're down to five. Um, let's see here. Anyway, he's going to tell them. Um, now, we have better things that we see in you is kind of what he's going to tell them. Uh, verse 9, the, even though we speak this way, chapter 6, verse 9, um, in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. Um, and, I mean, you kind of get the idea that he's going to go down here, but at the same time, it's, it's a, again, it's a rhetoric type of device. He's, he's getting their attention with something, and he's going to kind of break them over the coals a little bit by introducing a few more things to make his point. Then he's going to come out of it, and, you know, to the idea of something like, now, I, I mean, I know it's not as bad as that. But here's my point. Uh, it's kind of what we're going to see. So, there at the end of chapter 5, um, you know, we have much to say, but it's hard to explain because you have become dull in hearing. Uh, you know, and this, is, it, it's a callback to kind of Isaiah. Jesus also brought it up, those who hear without hearing, right? You know, that, that you're, you're, you hear it, but when you hear, you're not really getting it. Um, and this time, you should be teachers, and you need someone to teach again to you the first principles. Uh, and by the way, this is across the board. You know, when you start out as a babe in Christ, what do you need? Milk, right? You, you need elementary principles. You need to be grounded in the easy things. The stuff that you, you just, you know, you kind of need to know and understand. You have to lay a foundation. But if you've been a Christian for 20, 30 years, and that foundation is all that you've got, what's wrong? All right, you, you haven't been growing. You haven't been feeding yourself. You're, you're staying a babe, uh, drinking milk, when you should be, you know, chewing on USDA prime choice, right? I mean, that's, that's what the issue is. Uh, this is all about growing. 
And, uh, verse 14, solid food is for the mature who, what? Who have the powers of discernment trained by constant practice to what end? This isn't a matter of just having Bible knowledge, you know, book smarts. This is about being able to discern what's good and what's evil. I mean, this is about morality, that your growth is important because your growth gets you to a point of, you know, being able to discern good and evil. You, you should be always on an upward trend. Um, so, verse, chapter 6, verse 1, Therefore let us leave the elementary principles or doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith towards God, of instruction about washings, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. Um, and there's, there's discussion, there's debate, we don't have time for it, over if this is referring to stuff from the Old Covenant, because that's what he's comparing or new okay. I, I firmly believe he's talking about elementary principles of Christianity. The instructions about washing, I think, is discussion about baptism. Um, you know, I, I don't think he's saying, hey, let's move on away from this because this isn't what's under discussion at this moment. At this moment, he says, you all are babes in Christ, and you guys are still back here, you know, in the elementary principles, when you should be up here. And so all of this stuff, I, I, I mean, it's debatable. You know, if you don't agree with that, chew on it. You know, if you don't like the taste, spit it out. No big deal. Um, but I think that's what's happening, is that this is referring to stuff that is about Christianity, the elementary principles of Christianity. Um, and then we're going to, I mean, we're not that far behind, and we've got multiple weeks to get through this large section. That's the way that I've set it up. So if we get behind in one little bit, we can make it up in the next one. Uh, because this section has, well, let's see. This one has two weeks for it. Um, so we should be okay to get through this. And then we have three weeks for the next section. So we're doing okay. Uh, but we're gonna pick up there with the impossibility of bringing someone to back to repentance next week. Someone remember that for me, all right? All right, any last questions or comments? That was our second bell. All right, we will end there. Thanks a lot, guys, good class.